so let's go back to today's message. We are sitting on in him, in us, paradoxes. In him, in us, paradoxes. And this is a sub-theme and our big theme for the year. Knowing Jesus, knowing me, making him known. Say it with me. One more time. So in that subset, today we are looking at in him, that Christ in us, and then we in him. This confuses my thinking. So it is in him, in us, paradoxes. We are looking at how contradictions are true in faith. That in certain times of your life, you need to fight from a posture of who you are in Christ. And sometimes you need to fight from a posture of who Christ is in your life. So last week we looked at a very important theme. I started it with who Christ is in us. And we have said Jesus, when he gets into our heart, he changes his nature to become what? Hope. And this hope is the hope of glory. In other words, it is the bridge between where you are and where you can possibly be. Christ is the only reason why you should hope you can become what God said you can be. You can drive towards your dream. Christ is the reason why you should not throw down your dreams. That car, that house, that career for the young people, that position for some of you, that amount of money. Christ is the hope that it is possible you can go where you need to go. Today we want to look at it differently. We looked at Christ in us. So today we want to look at who do we become in Christ? Who are we when we sit in him? And remember how I introduced this message, that we are looking at the theology of location. Theology of locations. Why are locations important? Is because where you stay and where you find yourself at has three important things. Disadvantages, advantages, and opportunities. Opportunities and advantages. They're supposed to be the third one. The pastor has forgotten it. So locations by nature has advantages, uh, disadvantages, and opportunities. I've forgotten the third one because advantages and opportunities are the same thing. This is why some of you stay in nice places because you are looking for security. A place where you reside can give you what? Security. You stay in it. And sometimes it's the most expensive ad advantage that comes with it outweighs the cost. Sometimes you can stay in a place that makes you more vulnerable. There are too many thieves. So when you walk around, you are too careful. So locations by nature either exposes you or protects you. Let's go into this location called in Christ. And let's see, what are the privileges? Are there threats there? Are there privileges? Are there opportunities that because of our locations in Christ, we can access them? This is why I want you to memorize the song, In Christ Alone, In Him, preposition, you getting into Christ. Go with me, if you can, to the book of Acts Chapter number 17, and I said in the morning, people looked at me like I am a devil, but you know I'm a child of God. I'm God's favorite boy, and I love Jesus, but I have my favorite themes in Scripture, and I said in the morning service that the book of Acts is not one of my favorite books, and there are other books that I prefer. And people looked at me like they love all the books in the Bible. I don't love all of them. There are those that I like and those that I love. Have you ever read something in the Bible and felt like you should close that chapter and go and look for a nice chapter? Please, read all the scriptures in the Bible. Don't be like me. Yeah, All God's word is meant for you. Concentrate in that area where when you read it, you feel like going to the bathroom first. So I want to sit in the book of Acts for today's discussion. I'm in Acts chapter number 17. It's going to be a slightly long read. I'm starting from verse number 22. 
Paul then stood up in the meeting of Iropa Gas. I want you to read that word. I know that version gives you, gives you the location, the physical location, not the meeting place. I'll, I'll explain that. And said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked at your objects of worship, I even found out an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. For you are so ignorant of the very thing you worship. Yeah, I think Paul was like me. So, so somewhere. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. That's number 24. He starts his message. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Paul is making a paradigm shift that God does not stay in things that are made of what? Humans. Let's listen to the next thing. And he says, and this same God, he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. A very strong concept I've taught here about reciprocity, that God does not need human hands to serve him. And let's, let's continue. Let me not interrupt the scripture. Rather, he himself gives everyone what? Life and breath. Say it with me. Life and breath. And everything else. In other words, he gives everything life and breath. Because we should not assume we are the only one for another day. Verse number 26. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed what? Times in history. This is why empires came and are gone. Look at the next theme. And he drew boundaries of their lands. In other words, God drew the borders of Botswana. I know there are missionaries and other people who came and so forth. But hey, the intent of heaven saw it coming. Paul says, it is God who controls the borders and the territories of men. I wish I had time. Verse number 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find through him that he is not what? Far from any one of us. In other words, God is closer to you. Say it with me. God is closer to me. Paul says he's not far away from any of us. And I know some of you came here this morning to worship a very far God. But that same God who is far is also close. It's called double aspect. I've taught it here and I'm teaching on it here as a paradox, a contradiction that he who is what? Far is also what? Close. It's just that you have limited knowledge and science cannot explain the truth of how things can be what? Far and yet what? Close. How you can be in Christ and yet Christ is in you. We don't have the language to articulate the spiritual dimensions of reality. So please, don't use spectacles of science to view the commodities and molecules and cells of spirituality. They are slightly in a higher dimension. He who is what? Far is also how? Close. Let's go ahead. Verse number 28 is my key text. For in him we live. Where? In him. Where do we do what? We live. Next, and we move. Third, and we have our be. One more time, let's read it together. For in him we live and move and have our be. And as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. What does that mean? We come from him. Verse number 29. Therefore, since we are God's what? Offspring. What does that mean? Therefore, since we are the ones who come out of God. What should we do? We should not think that the divine being is like what? Gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. What a text. This one I like in the book of Acts. I really like this one. 
Because it defines a dimension of existence in highest language of clarity that we don't see it anywhere. That in him we live and move and have our being. Now I want to go into this text with understanding and I want to bring you into Greece, a country called Greece. Read the whole chapter for your own understanding. Paul has been staying in Thessalonica, which is like in Getu. He's on the northern side, and there was confusion there in Thessalonica. He moved again to Berea, and there were slightly issues there. And he came to the capital city called Athens. In Athens, he moves to a place called the Mass Hill, and there he goes to a council meeting of Aropagus. Aropagus. Now, I want to them to show you what Aropagus is because I want to contextualize the scripture so that I help you know who you are in Christ. Now, there's a place, and I think I've given you some picture, guys, if you can show it there. So there's a place where Paul is, and he's having this discussion there. And uh, me and uh, uh, Kek have been to Greece, and we have been to Athens. And while we are there, I'm sorry, Kek, uh, while we are there, Tepo, whom I call Kek, proclaimed himself as an apostle. <laughs> I don't know what happened. So we went to the street where Paul walked and to the street where it was written to the unknown God. After we came back, Kek said, no, now I'm an apostle. So I said, why? He said, no, I've walked where the apostles walked. <laughs> yeah. So Greece is a very interesting... Now, here is where Paul is. I want you to, to get. So Areopagus is the place where the team or the disciples who belonged to Aristotle, you all know Aristotle if you have gone to school, met. Remember, it was not only Jesus who had the disciples. At this particular time, there were groups of council. This was a council in Athens that used to meet. The people who met there, they debated science, mathematics, philosophy. Those were the three major subjects. And they used the Aristotle model in the Aropagus school of thought. There was also the Platonic school of thought, which was based on the teachings of Plato and many other philosophers. Now, Paul is going to the Aristotle group of guys. This is where we read in verse, number, in verse number 24. Let me go back to it. Then Paul, I mean, verse number 22. Where is it? Paul stood up in the meeting of the council of the guys who belongs to what? Aristotle's way of thinking. This is very important in understanding this text. He's speaking to the guys who belong to, to the school of thought of Aristotle. Now, I need to bring you in speed to help you understand how the Aropagus thought and how Aristotle, the founder of their school of thought, thought, and how Aristotle, who is today the father of modern science, thought. Before Aristotle could come in, there was a guy who was called Plato. Plato was a guy who was a student of a guy called Socrates. Now let's study it from Plato because Plato developed something very interesting. It is a theory we call the theory of forms. The theory of forms says how things exist. It is found within the school of thought of metaphysics. In Plato's analysis, things exist in two worlds. And Plato has been accredited the father of idealism because he said everything first exists as an idea. He's called that the world of forms. That this phone, before it existed, it existed in the mind of a person as a form. Plato argued, this is a tangible reality. And then he argued that then that form translates into the world of reality, and the reality is this phone. So that there are two types of, of, of the phone. This one I'm holding on, and the one that existed in the mind of the person who designed this. According to Plato, the best model is the one that is in the world of ideas. If you read some of the documents of Plato, he says that if you see a beautiful woman, you have not seen the one. Imagine the one who existed in the world of forms 
of the conception of that woman. He says beauty is best in its abstract form. And in its reality, it's just a masqueration of the embodiment of the world of form. So that was Plato. He brought idealism and realism. Aristotle came after Plato. And what Aristotle did is he rejected the theory of forms and negated what his boss or former teacher has said. Aristotle argued that a thing is in its realism, that the embodiment of the two facets of a thing are found in the world of its reality. He says, I don't want to see the, the, the theory or the idea that was in the guy who did this phone. I just want to use a functional phone and this is the reality. I don't know of the other one. He says, I don't want to be interested in the beauty that I can imagine. This is the beauty that I see. I like it. I want this beauty. And he called that realism. So he brought two themes into one theme and negated the existence of the other thing. Now we know who Paul is. Paul by foundation, he is more platonic. He doesn't belong to the school of, he doesn't belong to the fuel of Aristotle. Most of the time he think platonic more often than Aristotle. But when he goes to the school of the Aristotle, they are debating about Jesus and who he became. Paul stood among the people and in his presentation, he says to the guys who belongs to the philosophy of the school of Aristotle, he says, guys, here is how we need to understand the subject of ontology. The subject of metaphysics. So here's the discussion. This discussion is big in philosophy and in thinking. He says, here is who we have become. In him we do what? Live, move, and have our being. Now, I need to help you what Paul is doing here for you to understand the argument that is at the discussion here is that Paul is moving away from a platonic reasoning to an Aristotelian reasoning to present Christ to these guys. And he says, what you have been wondering about, here is its reason, is that all life, all motion, and all ontological and existentialism and essentialism, I'm going to help you understand, it's just that I went to school, are found in Christ. That's his argument. Now, let's, let's, let's go back because I want us to understand who we are in Christ. Here's his first argument. He says, in Christ we live. So this was a very surprising thought, but because now he had departed from dualism, which is the idea that we are here, God is in there, he is now going monastic. In approach. He says, we and God, we are found in the same place. And he explained certain things. Now I want to help you based on the understanding of the people who are here here. What was Paul's message to them? When they had, in Christ we live. At this particular time of knowledge, here is how living was constructed. There was a view. Clap hands for Jesus. These things are important. Yeah. No, I'll bring it back. Just that it's work. Yeah. But I am getting interrupted when I take it off. But to put it is all. Oh, okay, nice. What are we talking about? <laughs> so, so, there are three important characteristics that defined in him we live. So when, when, when the students of Aristotle heard that in Christ we live, they all listened with all their attention. Here was the first thing that it meant to them. The, it meant that God was the environment of existence. There was a view that anything that has to live, it has to first depend on an environment. This view was coming from metaphysics. There was a view in metaphysics between uh, conditioned and absolute things. And we as human beings were, were seen as conditioned things. So we needed an environment of absolute things. And here's what Paul was saying. God is our absolute 
and we are conditioned to exist in him. He is our environment. So they said, okay, this sounds like it. God is my environment. And this is what I need to proclaim to you today in modern gaps, that your environment of life, it's found in God. How many of you want to live? How many of you want to live? It is only in Christ that you can live. In him we do what? Live. What does that mean? It means God is your best environment of expression. Some of us have tried living outside God. You know what you got. And I'm not in a mood to attack anyone. But all of us have had an experiences where we have tried living outside God. And here's the opposite truth. Outside him we do what? We die. The Aristotelian understood the theory of, form, of source. That a thing is only alive when it is connected to its source. Once it is taken out of its source, it dies. You can take a tree, pluck it out of the ground, and leave it there. It will take several days, sometimes several weeks. Eventually, it will do what? It will dry. Paul was saying to these guys, God is the source. And the only time we live is when we are in him. Because Aristotle himself subscribed to the theory of source. The absolute thing in metaphysics. So Paul said to them, guys, God is our source. In him we do what? Live. Can I encourage somebody this morning? There is no life anywhere. Life is in Christ. Don't play with your life and try to make it work. It won't work. Life outside Jesus does not do what? Work. In him we live. Number two, there was an understanding at this time that living entails breathing. So Paul was saying to them, in Christ we breathe in and out. And they recognized that their breath is only valid when they are in Christ. Read the text very well. The scripture says many Greeks believed in the message. And I like the other side. The other guys may not like it. The other side. So here's what the verse says. It says many Greeks believed in him, including prominent women. It's a story for another time. It's a story for another time. Go and check it. Including prominent women, because there are occasions in life where women become more prominent than men. And the women said... So they understood that breath comes from God. Can I, can I just encourage someone today? You are wondering on whether you should give your life to Jesus, be serious with this Jesus stuff. Here's what it means. Your life, your breath, only survives in him. You can only breathe life to people around you if you are in him. The third thing that meant existence at that time was that every living thing that exists should be able to reproduce. This is a very interesting one. That if you are alive, if a thing is alive in the school of the Aristotelian club, it was that it should be able to do what? To reproduce. Now here's how the Aristotle school of thought understood blood. I mean understood Paul. They said, so you mean that our reproduction, our ability to multiply and become many, where is it? It is in God. And it's the same truth we want to amplify today. Ask me, what is our greatest problem in the modern times today? It's because we do reproduction outside God. It's a problem. Reproduction outside the parameters that God has set is a problem. Can I encourage somebody here today in case you, you are single and it has taken time and you feel like, oh, I just need a child. A child outside the protocol of how God intended children to come is a problem. And I'm not saying the problem is the child, but we are creating problems. In case you are having girls only in your, in your family, and as a guy, you are thinking like your gentleman, I will say, you don't have a son, maybe try somewhere outside, or maybe, yeah, you are a lady, and they say, no, maybe get somebody else. Make a boy, a child, outside 
God's will. It's a problem. Reproduction outside God's way of doing things. It's a problem. Paul says to them, in him we live, we reproduce in him. Today they talk about a lot of things, homosexualities and so forth, girls for girls, boys for girls. Outside God, what do we do? We die. Reproduction is best than God's way. From children who wonder about their identities to sicknesses and diseases that attacks our modern world today to confusion and distress and depressions that comes in our world today. What is the source of the problem? We do reproduction outside God. Paul says, in him only do we live. Second thing he says to them, in him we have motion. We live and we move. Interesting to study the etymology and the word that is used there for move. And here's one of the popular thoughts that is being ascribed to this text is that Paul's speech on the fact that we move in Christ is actually an articulation of how human progress is embedded in Christ. So he says, in Christ we do what? We live and then we make progress. Here's the other way to think about it, very scientific way. In him we evolve. We make changes of progress when we are in Christ. If you are here today, maybe you don't see motion in your life. You don't see progress in your life. It may be that you are outside Christ. And here's the message of today. There is no progress outside Christ. It is interesting when we study change, because some scholars tell you that this word also deals with change. So Paul is saying we, we live in Christ and we change in Christ. In all our developmental stages, we can do that in Christ. Isn't that not beautiful? That when you are in Christ, you can evolve and develop different shades of your life that are beautiful in Christ. So Paul says, your evolution process should be in Christ. Your change should be in Christ. But how many times do we see ourselves te tempted to do changes outside God's will? And when we do that, we experience a certain type of movement. We call it in change dynamics a retrogressive change. Retrogressive change occurs when you make decisions about change, hoping that they will produce certain positive results only to find later on that they've taken you how? Backward. Have you ever been there where you made certain decisions? You know, it looked like disobeying your parents, not listening to what people are saying. Sounded good. It looked like you are reasoning well. It looked like you have calculated all things. It looked like a good step and you took it and it was outside God's will. And then two days, three weeks, three months, three years, you regret about it is because progress is only possible in God. Say it with me. Progress is only possible in God. Do you want progress? Do it God's way. Yes, here's what we also see. Remember we are studying motion. This is Plato. This is in Aristotle. No, this is Aristotle. This is in the school of Aristotle who then coined a lot of theory about motion. Velocity is the same guy. That the speed that we go towards, Paul is urging to them, if you need speed, it's where? If you need motion, if you need progress, it's where? It's in God. Because there are tendencies that sometimes when we have been in a place for the longest time and we need what? Speed. We need what? To attain certain things. We forget the direction that should be at the equivalent of the motion of the object that is moving. And then we find ourselves moving, but in the wrong direction. And it's not good for us. Paul says progress, speed should be within God. One of the biggest temptations of our time is getting things done within speed. Getting that guy that you want within speed. Getting that girl that we want within it. Getting that money that you get. Building that house within speed. Completing that degree within. Everything on speed. But here's what Paul says. Speed outside God does not save and I want to encourage you today. Maybe it's tough in your life. Maybe things are not happening at the speed that you want. 
be patient with God. In him we, you do what? You live. In him you do what? You make progress. Maybe you, your promotion is taking time and you feel like taking it into your own hands, turning the wheel of time so that you can get what you need the most. If progress does not come from God, it may look green, but once you get over, it dries off. It's better to wait for progress that comes from God than the one that you manufacture. Paul says, living, reproduction, it's in God. Breathing, it's in God. The environment that is conducive for the best expression of yourself, it's in God. And your motion of progress in all its diversity, it's in God. Trust God about your next level. Trust God about your next dreams. Trust God about your progress, about your adulthood, about your children, about the next thing that you are going to be. Then he goes to a very interesting discussion that we need to go. He says, in him we live. And I've shown you three things of how they understood him. And then he goes, in him we have what? Motion. We move. We make progress that is positive, that works for us. And then he says, and in him we have our be. This is a very interesting subject of how our nature of existence is in our being and how our being is in Christ. Now there was a difference in thinking between the Platonic school of thought and Aristotle. Plato had argued that, so, so, so there's this a big branch of knowledge in philosophy called ontology. And metaphysics. So they all discuss how things, how matter, this is how we say it in a better language, how matter exists and what are the constituents of matter and what is the essence of matter. Out of this theory of ontology and metaphysics, we study two important sub brackets called existentialism, which is how and why things okay and exist, and essentialism, which is what is the essence of things that exist and how are they essential to us? Now, Plato was more existentialism. So he focused more on the, the existence of things and he argued that existence precedes purpose. So we derive it based on existence. Aristotle on the other side embraced both existentialism and essentialism. Yeah, preaching is work. Yeah. <laughs> And teaching is work. Uh, and listening is also work. So he brought up two important concepts. What is that? Essence and existence. Existential, existentialism and essentialism. How do we find our being? Because if you ask me today, in the world where we suffer from depressions and anxieties and identity crisis, what are we dealing with? We are dealing with our essence. Who am I? It's amazing, I've been using. So what is this one also doing? <laughs> yeah. So let me try to put it. But I, it's always difficult to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I know today I look good again. <laughs> yeah, so the pastor is nice on a jacket. What were we talking about? So, so Aristotle brought the two schools of thought. That your essence and the reasons for existence. Paul is saying to them, guys, the reason for your existence and the essence of your being, where is it found? In Christ. And I was talking about how in the modern world we are tormented by depressions, questions of who am I? Where am I, where am I doing it? I mean, there, you can't believe it how so many people spend sleepless nights in experiencing questions. Am I worth living? What am I doing here? What is my role of being here? Do I deserve to live? Should I continue living? Am I important? How essential am I? Because we are looking at things to derive our being. How many of us 
feel so bad because of the mistakes we have done, because of the behavior that we exhibited, because we think our definition of being is on what happened to us, on what we have done, and on where we come from. Paul says, no, guys, how your being is not based on where you come from, what you have done, what has happened to you, who is your dad, who is your mom. He says, our being is where? In him. And that's a message today to all of us. The definition of who you are is in Christ. Put your hand on your chest and say, I am in Christ. My definition is in Christ. My being is in Christ. Here's what it means. You don't need to seek the reason for your being on addictions, on sexual passions, on anything else. Where is it located? It is located in a place. Where is that place? In Christ. If you are suffering from a lot of anxieties and you question your existence and you question a lot of things regarding your purpose, where is it? It is in Christ. And at this particular time, essentialism linked being with three important things. I want to deal with them. And they were part of it that were also in existentialism. That the reason for our being is found in our passions. So Paul is saying, because people were asking, philosophers were asking questions. What is interest? What is passion? What is aspiration? Why do beings think this way? And Paul says, all of that, it's functional, beneficial when it's in Christ. And I can tell you in today's world, there are a lot of things that are destroying us today in our generation. And it's because if you have passions that are not in Christ, they will lead you astray. Your passions, your interests, your aspirations, your dreams, if they are not where? In Christ. They will result in bad consequences. Move away from them. You may feel them, you may experience them, but passions outside Christ, whether they are for things, for pleasure, for music, for sex, for whatever, if those passions are not done within the platform of Christ, they are inconsequential. Paul says, in him we live, we move, we found our passion in him. Number two, the concept of being in ontological discussions entailed purpose. Essentialism had to deal with the question of, where am I here? What is my role? What is my purpose? And Paul was saying, all that you guys have been researching about trying to find, it is in him because you find your being in him. And if there's anyone in our midst today, you are wondering about your purpose, wondering about who you are. Maybe people have taken advantage of you. Maybe you have lived to try to impress certain people and they didn't respond well. Maybe you thought your parents will validate you enough to find your purpose. Maybe you thought your pastor will do. Maybe you thought your girlfriend will do. Maybe you thought a boyfriend you should do. Maybe you married a guy or a girl and you thought he will validate your purpose. No, purpose is not derived from partners. It is only in Christ. Paul argues, guys, your being can only be established in the rock, the solid rock, Jesus himself. In him, you find your purpose. It is not in your money, in your profession, in your children, in anything. If there is the highest ful ful fulfillment, I think that's the right way, fulfillment <laughs> that you can get, it is going to come from who? Christ. And we live in the days where a husband's prior pressurized women, satisfy me. No, your satisfaction is, comes from who? Who? Christ. Where, where wives also look at husband, satisfy me. No, your satisfaction is going to come from whom? Christ. The theory of self-actualization, which came later on, is derived from ontological understanding of essentialism. That we get our self-actualization from who? Christ. Stop looking for what God can give you in men. Stop looking what, for what God can give you in other places. It can only be found in Christ. It is only Jesus who can answer the questions of your minds and satisfy your soul. 
He is the melody that can trabalize all your questions and your issues and keep you at steel. Your being is in Christ. The concept of being also entailed destiny. There were questions around philosophers. What is our end? And Paul said, guys, our starting and our end is where? It's in Christ. Stop looking and asking the stars and trying to look for things. No, your destiny is in Christ. Because in him, you can only do what? Live, have your motion, and have your being. There is no way you can end without Christ. End in him. And that's my encouragement today. If you have been wondering and thinking about how is your end supposed to be, here's my encouragement. The best decision that you can ever do for your life is to make sure that your end is in Jesus, is in Christ. End your life in him. Because it will be so sad when you end your life without Jesus and find yourself in hell and find yourself in a place too toxic for a spiritual quality you are to be at. End your life in Jesus. Stay in Jesus. You can only become the best version of yourself if you are in Christ. If you take progress from Christ. But here is what I know. There are so many temptations. Today they are offering drugs to deceive our young people to feel in a moment of ecstasy that life seems to be flying. They feel like things are becoming better and nothing at the end of the day comes out of that experience. Today they are selling sex and deceiving our young people and our adults to a sex drive around that does not... That does not result in any positive change. And at the end of the day, sex, drugs, alcohol, everything does not satisfy the soul. It is only Jesus. But when you move away from everything else and you focus on him, he can quench the thirst that is in your soul and satisfy you. Not all things may go right, but here is what you can get if you are in Christ. You are in a better place. If you are in Christ, you are in a better waiting space. Paul reason at Aropagas that the best place to be at is in a place called Christ. He changed the thinking about God to a location that we can go to. He's introducing in the theory of metaphysics and ontological discussions that there are things that are located in spaces, intangible, abstract. There are abstract spaces that we can go to. And he mentions a place. It's called in Christ. Today I'm inviting you to go to this place called in Christ. When you get there, in case you are suffocating out of life issues, you will begin to live. In case you are staying in one place without your life showing progress, you'll begin to see signs of progress. In case you are wondering about your being and how far you can go, and questions and, and a lot of turbulence and boisterous winds in your mind, questioning your being, when you arrive in that place, you settle down. Amen. Let's stand on our feet this morning. And as we do, I want to make three important altar calls. I've said at the beginning of this series, that the Lord impressed me that we should not just talk about it. Christ can be experienced. Christ can reveal himself to you. So this is not a feel-good message. It's a reality that can be experienced. You can experience Christ in you, that you live in him. You can experience Christ in your progress. You can experience Christ answering and quietening issues in your life. So I want to call three important altar calls. If you want to live and maybe your life is not in Christ, I'm calling you to come to the living way. Jesus Christ. He will save your soul. He will quench your thirst. If that's you, as I call you, come this side. If you are coming and maybe you are here, maybe you have no motion in your life. There's no progress. There's no positive change. We make it in Christ. 
And we are saying, Pastor, I want progress. I want motion. I want speed. It's best in Christ. I want you to come. And if maybe you are here, you are saying, oh, I have issues with my being. I don't know who my dad is. I don't know why I'm here. I, I've changed jobs. I've moved places. I've tried this. I, I don't know. I want to know who I am. If that's you, all of you, at whatever direction, as long as you are here, just come to the front. We want to pray with you. That Jesus may reveal himself to you. Let's come quickly, please, so that we can pray with you and let you go. In him, we live, we move, and we find our being. It is in Christ where you can find your living. It is in Christ where you can find your breath. It is in Christ where you can find your motion, your progress. It is in Christ who can silent questions that the enemy is coming you. Let's come quickly, please, so we can pray. Just come. This is the safe place. He's going to meet you right in this place and transform you. You will find your satisfaction in him. I'm a modern preacher. I don't like compelling people to come forward. But I feel like you are left behind. Can you come, please? So we, we pray for you. Yeah. I don't, I don't pray for people most often. You know that if you come to this church. But when the Spirit is leading us this way, don't remain behind. We have asked the Lord to touch you as you come to this place for your change. Now, those of you who are here, I've asked the Lord. Yesterday night, I pleaded with the Lord right in this altar. No one is coming to lay hands on you. But this is the place where God is expecting you to stand. And as you lift up your hands and tell it to God, candidly, explicitly, Lord, I am here. Can you touch my soul? Can you change me from the inside? The power of God is going to hit you and change you from the inside and answer questions that none of us, including me, can answer. Would you lift up your hands? Would you tell it to God? Imagine him here. The scripture says, he is so clear. He is so near to you. He's not far. He's not in heaven. He's right closer to your hand. Call on his name. And those of you who are at the back, I know you are not better. You have issues that needs God. You have issues that needs God. Today, we are not playing games at church. We want to touch the hand of his garment. Lift up your hands too. And cry to God for your situation. Right where you are and say, God, reach me where I am. Come on, all of us, we are praying. Lift up your voice and begin to cry to God and say, Lord, I can only live in you. Come on, let's lift up our voice and cry to God right where we are. Father, in the name of Jesus, men and women are praying. In the name of Jesus, I pray that, Lord, may you touch them by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, I pray that, Lord, you may touch, you may touch men and women in this place by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, I pray that may the Spirit of God move in this place. Touch men and women in this place. I pray for those that, Lord, need to see you in their motion, in their progress, in their evolution. I pray that may the Spirit of God touch them in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling with questions of their being, that may the Spirit of God touch them. I pray for those that are desiring for change, that, Lord, may you touch them. Move in this auditorium. Shift, change, break every yoke and every power of darkness in the lives of your people. Let there be transformations in this hall, transformation in this auditorium, transformation on those watching online. Touch them by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, men and women watching online, I pray that you touch them, you change their lives. And those standing in the altar, let there be a shift in their lives. I rebuke demonic spirit and powers of hell holding your people ransom. I rebuke them in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I declare, let there be change. Those thirsty, thirsty for your touch, thirsty for transformation, thirsty for results. Lord, thirsty for healings of their minds and their issues. 
move in their lives and touch them. And those who don't know you, Jesus, reveal yourself to them as the Christ who dwells in them. In Jesus' name. Thank you for moving. Thank you for touching. In the name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a big hand. Take your seats. Thank you for coming. You can take your seats. Thank you. Thank you.